Okay, so I decided to do a quick sit-down episode uh, in the car here, and I just go over the good news that I have. Um, the car is now finally, I'm not going to say street legal, but it is registered and titled. Um, technically, it's fairly street legal. There's a few little nuances I have to work out, but um, I just want to give you a quick um, idea on the registration process for the exit. Now, this is only going to apply to the state of Oregon, which almost all of you don't live in probably, but um, every state's different, of course, with the registration laws. The one funny thing about Oregon is, is it's actually as liberal and, um, you know, very environmentally sensitive or whatever you want to call it. It is extremely liberal, liberal on, or extremely loose on and lenient on uh, vehicle laws. I mean, you can literally build a car out of wood in your garage and put a lawnmower engine on it, and as long as it has four wheels and you can get a person to sign off that it's a special interest vehicle, you could register the vehicle. Um, it's very, very surprising. There is. Unlike California and some other states, there is no um, safety checks, no you know DOT checks for lights. Um, there's no uh, you know inspection on anything besides basically a DMV employee comes out and looks at it and goes, okay, yes, this exists. Um, but there are some loopholes you have to jump through. So I have a list here. Uh, basically, first off, I'm going to tell you how I ended up going through the registration process, and then I'm going to tell you how. Now knowing what I've done, if I did it again, or if, if you were in Oregon needing to do it, um, how you should, in my opinion, go about the registration process. So basically, um, the big issue is the frame does not have a VIN number, and the Miata technically does not have a VIN number. It does on the engine, but my engine that VIN number doesn't match the bill of sale VIN number from the body. So there's no VIN number for the roller skate and there's no VIN number on the frame. And that's really the tie up for DMV. They want you to have a DMV, they want you to have a VIN number, but they can issue one at the office. Um, so in my case, the employee was a little stumped and I tried calling in several times to the, to the main state office, zero help. Um, I vis ended up having to visit the DMV three times. Um, and yesterday on my third time I had called the lady I've been working with for a month on this beforehand got everything sorted out and I was fairly certain I was going to be good to go but um, having not been able to to leave with a registration uh, the previous two times I wasn't certain so basically the loophole I have is I live in a DEQ an air quality testing area in Oregon basically the Portland metro area um, so the car has to run through DEQ every two to four years, depending on what it is, um, for air quality testing. Before I bought the kit, I had contacted someone at the DEQ offices in Salem, Oregon, and they mentioned to me that you cannot register it as a 2018 Xmotive X set because when we go to put that in the computer, it's going to go, okay, it's 2018 car. So when we plug into your OBD2 port, which I don't have, um, it is going to say this isn't a 2018 car because there's a signal sent back from the ECU that this is the car make model year. This is the signal it gives to the DEQ testing equipment. Um, so he said you absolutely cannot do that. So he said you need to try to register it as a special interest vehicle. Um, and so I knew there was, I, I, I didn't get a definitive answer before I bought the kit because I knew I could get it done. There was just three or four different ways of going about it and I had to basically, um, you know, figure out which one of those ways I was going to use, but I wasn't concerned about it until I was, you know, at that moment of needing to register the car. So basically the loophole I found is I need to have a special interest plate on the car, which uh, allows you to be exempt for life from DEQ. And the nice, this is kind of the nice thing is it, it allows you also to never have to pay registration again. It is a one-time registration fee. I think it was $100 for the registration, and it's registered as long as I own the car to me. Um, so that's kind of nice. That's a little cheaper on that end, but really, from what I've read around, I mean, Oregon registration fees are extremely cheap. It's like 100 bucks for two years. Um, a lot of states I've read, it, they're a couple hundred bucks for a year or two. So um, we have been very lucky. My, my whole registration title, uh, licensing, getting the license plates, everything was $212. Um, 
um, which was a lot, you know, but I guess compared to a lot of other people that I've seen they've gone through, it's, it's very reasonable. So um, anyways, back on topic. Um, I need to get it as a special interest vehicle. Um, there's a form for Oregon that basically um, shows the what you need to have to become a special interest vehicle. There is the model has the, the, the vehicle has to be over 25 years old. The vehicle has to be um, uh, signed off as a special interest vehicle by an approved organization. Uh, the vehicle has to be a replica or the vehicle, I can't remember, it's some off-road thing. Um, so basically what I went with first was the lady at the DMV, my first visit, had said, okay, I took in a picture of a 1960 Lotus Super 7 and a picture of my car. I, I, I was smart enough to take them at similar angles. Uh, find a picture online that was a similar angle to the picture I was taking, similar color, everything like that to help kind of visually at work. And she went, yep, that, that looks like a replica of a 1960 Lotus 7 to me. Fantastic. So since it would be a replica car, it then could be registered as a special interest vehicle. So I went in the second time, towed it about 45 minutes away to a DMV office that I was told is never busy, that I had to wait an hour and a half at each time I went in, um, which was unfortunate, but now I was glued to this to this worker at the DMV and I needed to, to go see them. So I had to make about a 45 minute trip uh, towing the car there. And then I got there and she basically did a complete 180 on me and said, um, okay, I see these pictures, but that, let me go look at the car. We went out to the car and she went, Mm, that looks like a race car to me, not a Lotus 7. I s tried to explain to her, Lotus 7 is a race car. She went, yeah, you're not selling me on that. And I said, well, when I was in here a week and a half ago, it was fine. Yeah, I'm just not sure. So then she said, you can just register it as a 2018 Eximotive X set. And then you will, you know, new cars are exempt from DEQ for four years. And I said, fantastic. The issue is, in four years, if I still own the car, I'm screwed. She said, well, yeah. The only other option was finding an address I could register to uh, outside of the DEQ area. Um, and I had a, a couple possibilities on that, uh, some friends that I could have used. Uh, but it was, just, it was just a hassle I didn't want to potentially deal with if I still own this car in four years. So um, she said, there's one other option. I can talk to my, they, she didn't use the word regional manager, but it was something similar to that. Um, there's, there's evidently a person of hierarchy in each area um, that in that region they're like a technical person and when there's weird problems it gets escalated to them and so this lady Nona was her name um, I never talked to her evidently you know as far as the consumers concerned uh, you know she's in this locked metal box that no one can ever talk to um, so I had to go through this lady at the DMV office then to give the information to this Nona lady and find a solution to this problem. So um, the lady took copy at the DMV office, took copies of all my information, sent it to this person. About a week later, I got a call back from her, which was completely shocking to me. I figured I was going to get blown off because this lady definitely did not want to deal with my issue. Um, so a week later, I get a call saying, yes, we can do it as a 1960 Lotus 7. She said she will register it as that. That is not a problem. However, she wants more proof that it's a special interest vehicle because technically it's not a 1960 car. Technically it is a 2018 car. So she needs to have an approved organization in Oregon uh, inspect the vehicle. You have to get it inspected, have them sign a form, and then we will give you your special interest um, information. I went, okay. And so um, she proceeded to send me a list of these um, approved, I don't know what you'd call them, established organizations, I guess is how the state refers to them. So um, I got pretty lucky. I, I went on one of their websites, emailed the club president. Uh, he basically said, hey, I live a couple blocks from you. I know where you are. I, I'm not one of the people on this list, but um, let me email him. I'll get back to you. A couple hours later, I had an uh, email or a phone call back from him and said, this is this guy's number. He'll be back in town on Tuesday. Give him a call. He can come over Friday and inspect your vehicle. Great. So um, 
I gave the guy a call. He said, fantastic, you just have to make a small donation to our club, which I, of course, was more than happy to do. Um, and he goes, I'll be there on Friday morning if you have time. I said, sure, I will make time. Uh, he basically pulled up in my driveway, got out of his truck, went, this thing is awesome. Uh, love it, asked some questions about the car, goes, you know, this is the standard of a special interest vehicle. This is kind of the definition in the book. Um, so he grabs the form, signs off. It was a $20 donation they asked for, which is fine with me. And um, then I had my form. So called the lady at the DMV, uh, went in there yesterday. She still base. she didn't blow me off this time, but I was nervous about halfway through until I swiped my card and paid the paid the fees I wasn't sure it was gonna happen but um you know she just mainly was worried that she had all the information she needed to send up because she said otherwise they're just gonna send it back to you and decline it and she goes and a lot of times they lose your MCO tag and things like this so that got done I got my Oregon bin sticker which is actually just like a like a metal tinfoil sticker with it's like eight numbers on it or something. It's not even a real VIN. It's, that's now the recognized VIN, but it's not a 15 number VIN, funny enough, like you would have on a normal uh, uh, car from a car manufacturer. So um, now I have that. I have a temporary permit um, and uh, technically, I mean, I'm not insured, but technically the car is um, uh, registered and ready to go on the road. I'll have my plates in a few weeks and my title. Um, the one issue with a special interest, there are good things get you away from running fenders, certain mirrors, height things, exhaust noises, you know, a lot of those you're exempt from. The one issue is technically you're only supposed to use it for parades, club activities, um, going to a racetrack, car shows, um, and, but there is a line in there, you know, it is, it is not to be used as a daily transportation for persons, um, and it can be driven for maintenance and repair. So that's good enough. I mean, I'm not going to even put probably 500 miles a year on this thing, uh, maybe at most a thousand. So that's good enough that I can, if I really want to drive it in the summer, I can find a car show or a meet or I'm doing maintenance or repair or something like that. So it's really not going to be um, a big issue to, me, um, to have that. So um, anyways, that's, that's my very wordy and long story, sorry about um, how I got registered. Here real quick is if you were going to do it again, this is how I would register the car. Um, the other option is you can register it as a 2018 Eximotive X7. If you live in a DEQ area, you are screwed. Um, if you do not live in a DEQ area, which is like 80% of the land area in the state of Oregon, um, you're fine. You know, you probably would get pulled over for fenders, some lighting things, things like that, that you're going to have to be a little more street legal. But um, there's no other restriction. Basically, someone comes out to the car, looks at it, goes, okay, here's a VIN, you're good to go. If you're an assembled vehicle. Um, so I would do that, even if you're in DEQ area, then on the special interest form, I would check off the box that says, um, is deemed special interest by an established organization. I would call one of the people on the list I showed a few minutes ago and I would have them come out and from my experience they have no problem registering you as a special interest vehicle. So then you would still be a 2018 X Motive X set. You would have special interest which would allow you to um, bypass DEQ for good and have a one-time registration and the only limitation is you're limited on, limited on driving. Um, so you know if I was going to do it again I think that's the way I would have gone. I didn't really need to register it as a 1960 Lotus. I just um, I think that's a little easier down the road if I have to change that like if I down the road if I want to take special interest off I can say well it's a 1960 Lotus and they'd be like okay you don't need DEQ because how are they gonna know so um, anyways um, that's the reason I did it also with insurance stuff I can say it's a 1960 Lotus replica it's a little more okay that's what this car is we understand because uh, they do look quite similar um, so anyways you know that's how I would go about it um, anyways, I'm just waiting on insurance now. Uh, I got a couple quotes, not bad, about 250 a year, I think was one. Another one was about three or 400 a year. Um, very fair, uh, full coverage, decent, you know, I think 250 to $500,000 limits. Um, a lot of stuff like that. Uh, got a couple different quotes and reasonable. So gonna get that done. 
Then the next few videos I'm going to do, it's actually going to be pretty, the, the next one I'm really excited for, it's actually going to be a time lapse of me um, completely tearing down the car to the bare frame. Uh, I think that's going to be pretty cool. I'm just going to basically measure the time, tell you guys how long it will take for you to actually pull the body panels, wiring, uh, seats, you know, dash, pedals, the gas tank, everything off of the car down to a bare frame to be powder coat. And then I'm going to do the exact similar thing when I build it again. I'm going to show how long it would take me to actually put the car back together. Um, so it's going to be kind of cool because I don't think anyone's done one of those before of a complete disassembly, um, you know, and then rebuilding once they've already built the car. So that'll be a cool video coming up next. And then um, I'll have some videos of frame being powder coated. Uh, like I said, reassembly. There's a lot of carpeting and interior modifications I'm going to be doing here just to kind of spruce things up. And then after that, um, really, it's going to be going on to the turbo build stuff and um, building a custom exhaust and uh, downpipe and, you know, um, turbocharger, manifolds, you know, everything like that, getting it set up with the mega squirt, things like that. So got some pretty cool videos coming up on the way. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Sorry, I know it was long-winded on this one. I just really wanted to go into detail on everything I went through because if another person or two here in Oregon decide they want to build one of these cars, um, this hopefully will be helpful to you. If not, you can always email me or, or message me. I'm in the uh, Facebook uh, Exit Owners Group. Um, uh, I also am on Instagram. Um, yeah, so get a hold of me if you need help registering. I'd be more than happy to help. Hopefully make your life a little easier than my, mine was. But anyways, if you like this, please hit subscribe down below uh, and uh, hit like. So see you guys in the next one. Thank you.